Hey, Sam. Yeah, Tyler? What was your favorite movie from the Oscars this year? Um, I really liked Marriage Story. Ooh, mine was Parasite. Really? Yeah, I especially loved Katara in it. Uh, Tyler? Yeah, Sam? I don't think Katara was in the Korean comedy thriller Parasite. Yes, she was. I saw her. She was obviously very poor. She only had two copper pieces, and she swindled her way to get what she wanted from the rich. She was clearly a key part of that plot. Well, you're not wrong, but that wasn't the movie. It was the okay, episode. Okay, clearly you just need to watch the movie again. I'm Tyler Strandberg. And I'm Sam Albus. And this is the Avatar Podcast. Yep, yep. On this podcast, we watch the Nickelodeon show Avatar, The Last Airbender, episode by episode, and discuss it in detail. We talk about plot, themes, and character development throughout the show, as well as anything else we may notice that's also relevant to what's going on in the Avatar world, or what's going on in our world. At the end of each episode, we'll talk about who our favorite character was, as well as give the episode a rating on a scale of 1 to 10. You're listening to the Avatar podcast. Yep, yep. Sam, we are going to talk about... The episode after the one we talked about last week. Okay. That's one way of saying it. Yes. You mean the ninth episode? Is that what number we're on? Yes. This is the ninth episode of the Avatar podcast. Yes, then we are talking about the ninth episode of the season that we are on, which is corresponding to this podcast season. Yeah, the, the first ninth one. episode. <laughs> the the first episode. season, Sam. I was talking about season, not episode anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ninth episode of book one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about the ninth episode of book one. Which yeah, is, what is that called, Tyler? It's the I was getting to that, Okay, Sam. get to it then. <laughs> chop, chop here, Tyler. <laughs> it's called the waterbending scroll. Okay, awesome. And I'm going to read the synopsis in a very succinct manner. Yeah, clearly you're impatient about it. <laughs> Katara begins teaching Aang waterbending. To her fury, not only is he a fast learner, but he eventually surpasses her in skill. Not eventually, like right away. Anyway, <laughs> the group travels to a nearby town, finding a waterbending scroll at a store run by pirates. Determined to surpass Aang, Katara steals the scroll, causing the pirates to chase the group, though they manage to escape. Later, Zuko runs into the pirates. Zuko makes a deal with the pirates, saying that if the pirates capture Aang for him, he will find the scroll for the pirates. Zuko proceeds to cap capture Katara, and the pirates capture Aang and Sokka. A fight breaks out between Zuko's crew and the pirates when the latter learns Aang is the Avatar. During the commotion, the group escapes with the scroll. I took a shot every single time you said pirates in that description, and now I'm dead. <laughs> now I'm dead. I've died from alcohol poisoning. It's funny. We were actually talking right before we started recording this. I don't like the description for um, next week's episode. So we decided that instead of just copying and pasting the descriptions, we're going to start like actually reading them and changing them to our liking. Um, oh, that could have yeah. been needed during this one. <laughs> yeah, probably. But whatever. We got through oh, well. it and we made a joke out of it's it. It's fine. So it's cool. Uh, this episode premiered on Nickelodeon on April 29th, 2005 and was written by John O'Brien. Hey, John. Remember I said we would start to notice the episodes that John O'Brien writes? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. We're moving and on. And I noticed this episode. <laughs> I noticed this episode as well. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to plot and themes. Yes, we normally do this in the first part of I, the episode. For some reason, normally sing that every single time we do it, and I don't know why. You just like singing things, apparently. Um, let's talk about some things to know, things we noticed. I world like building. this is my favorite section. Yeah. I like that we do things to know. You do? And I hope our listeners do, too. OK, so we are introduced to the game Pie Show, which is the game that, you know, uh, Iroh was playing and, you know, he loses the lotus piece. Mm -hmm. This is a common game in the Avatar universe that appears multiple times, like a lot. And it's mentioned a lot, too. Um, we're going to move on from that point. This is the first time we see Aang waterbend when he's not in the Avatar state. And it is very easy for him. At one point in the episode when Katara's on the ship shopping for the pirate's merchandise, she sees a, like, monkey statue that she's weirdly infatuated with. Mm -hmm. And that monkey actually pops up multiple times throughout the series. 
Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, this is the first time we're seeing it. So every time that monkey pops up, we're going to be talking about it. We're going to be like, hey, there's that monkey from the waterbender skull. As far as I know, though, it doesn't play an important role. No, because I think I would remember it. It does not. If it does. Okay, cool. When Iroh's looking at it, he makes a weird monkey sound with it. Maybe it turns you into a monkey. (gasps) Maybe that's what it does. Because Iroh makes that weird sound that I will not repeat. No, I don't think you can even impersonate it. You you just said you weren't going to repeat it. Stop it. Stop it. I'm uncomfortable. Okay, let's move on. I'm a voiceover artist. <laughs> um, yeah, so the moral, like literally Sokka at the end of the episode says, so what did we learn while he's holding the scroll in his hand? And that's like a classic 90s cartoon thing. So the creators of the show wanted to parody that. Um, with the, you know, the subversion at the end of the episode where, what do we learn? And Katara says, stealing is wrong, except if it's from pirates. <laughs> Funny joke. And then they all laugh as they fly away. Uh-huh. 90s <laughs> cartoons. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was very on purpose. I think, I thought it was funny. It, it was funny. Um, speaking of funny, <laughs> this... <laughs> episode has something very special about it with one of our very close to my heart hilarious characters Zuko this is one of two times in the entire series that Zuko laughs how many episodes are there there's 24 episodes there's per 61 season 61 episodes 61 episodes and he laughs twice, twice. wow <laughs> yep and this is one of them oh my gosh so um there's like one theme here that I think is very separate from all of the rest. Um, but like there's like probably three or four themes that I wrote down that kind of all like blend in with each other. Yeah. So um, I think it would be best if we just approach this first one as a separate one. And then the rest of them, we kind of just are like, yeah, these all kind of go together. But this is kind of what we noticed. Sounds good to me. Uh, first theme is... Immoral ambiguity. Yes, lots of ambiguity in this episode and not a lot of like clear right and wrong. Let's dive into that. I found this quote in a a BuzzFeed article I was reading today. (laughs) Reputable sources. About Parasite, which is actually why I made the the cold open about Parasite. And it said, in a system that feels as if it is theft itself, Stealing in any other sense suddenly feels more justifiable. And I wow. thought that was very appropriate for this episode. That is, did, did, the, did the writer of the article write that? I think line? so. It wasn't quoted from someone. That's good. It That's was, good writing. Yeah. So, yeah, I felt that was very appropriate for this episode specifically um, because of all of the moral ambiguity surrounding the waterbending scroll. Um, it's very obvious that these pirates got all of their merchandise by stealing it and then make a profit off of it by selling it. Mm-hmm. And I have a big problem with that, Sam. Um, I am a little bit flexible on theft and stealing, um, but I personally believe that stealing from people is very wrong. So if I like went into your house and I stole something that belongs to you, I don't think that's okay. But let's bring this into context with Katara. So Katara then steals the scroll from the pirates. Yes. So was she justified in taking the scroll from the pirates? Well, let's think about that's where moral ambiguity comes in. Well, why would she have been justified by stealing that, Sam? If you think about it, like they, I mean, we find it's a water bending scroll Mm -hmm. and the like lead pirate dude with the weird monkey parrot on his shoulder is like, we got it somewhere up north for the best price free or whatever. I'm going to stop you right now because I want to clarify the animal looks like a parrot, but it sounds like a distorted monkey when it screams uh and that bothers me. Oh yeah. It doesn't squawk. It definitely screams, but yeah. So they stole it from the water tribe. Katara is the, is a member of the water tribe. So they are quite literally stealing a piece of her culture and selling it for profit. Sokka, where do you think they got it? They stole it from a waterbender. I don't know. I think that Katara could be justified in that she isn't stealing it to make money off of it. She is stealing it to, in a way, like self-defense. 
you know, mm-hmm. so that she can get better at protecting herself um, so that she can learn more about her culture. Mm-hmm. Um, it's less of like a, I'm stealing this to then profit off of it. It's more of taking it to better herself and better the world, I guess you could think, because she... Better Aang. Yeah, right? would be helping Aang learn. Um, also, it is a piece of her culture. Yeah, they they stole this girl from the Water Tribe. And I don't know. I will throw in my opinion on this. My take is I don't like stealing in any any context at all. But that's like a personal moral thing. Um, but I do acknowledge that there are ex- exceptions to this rule. Um, like, for example, we wrote down the specific question: Is it okay from people who, to steal from people who steal from others? It it depends. I don't like putting blanket statements on every you know situation. What is it that you're stealing? In this context, like, this item is literally a part of Katara's culture, and it, I think it is better suited for her use rather than what some rich dude from this village or, you know, bureaucrat or whatever is going to come buy it and then just stick it on their wall. Like, when Katara can use that to better herself and, like, get closer to her own culture. Right. In this context, I do think she was justified, um, even though I don't like the act of stealing, I think in general, it just depends. And in general, I would say, no, you shouldn't steal. Okay. That's my take. All right. Um, I think there's a little bit of anti-capitalist themes in here, um, just from Katara stealing from people who stole from others. Um, I vibe with it. Yeah. Fuck capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck capitalism. Steal. <laughs> steal. <laughs> Legally, we can't tell you to do that. <laughs> Don't steal, but steal. No, Sam, Sam, (laughs) no, no. No, like we cannot tell our listeners to steal from large corporations that already steal from millions of people every single day by stealing their time and then underpaying them. Wink. We can't tell our listeners to do that. That is wrong. Wink. (laughs) Uh, The next theme that we want to cover is jealousy. I... I don't get it. Who who's jealous in this episode? Um, Katara is jealous. Oh my in this god, episode. not Katana. Not not Katakana. <laughs> what not do, her. What do you mean Katana is jealous? <laughs> Catamaran, no. <laughs> Cataracts, you can still waterbend. <laughs> You're a really good waterbender. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let's talk <laughs> okay. about let's talk about this theme. Okay. Um, yeah, so we see that behaving in a jealous manner. Okay, just a quick side note. Um, I try jealously apparently isn't a word. Yeah, I was typing that out and it didn't work. It was just like, I think you mean jealousy. What is the adverb form of jealous jealousy? Because to me, reading this line we have, I'm just gonna read it. Behaving jealousy can hurt yourself and others. That's like part of this jealousy. Does it sound right? No, it doesn't sound right. (laughs) Does it sound right at all? Anyway. Anyway, we're going to keep talking about that. Yeah. Behaving in a jealous manner um, can hurt yourself and others. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one of the things Katara learns. Um, Yeah. We see this. There are many examples. Yes, many. (laughs) Um, I like the literal ones. Like she hurts herself with the water whip Mm -hmm. and um, she hurts Momo. (laughs) Yes. And then I like it. I like it afterwards when he's just standing like hunched over and like rubbing his butt. (laughs) But also like her jealousy, you know, of Aang because he took to bending so quick gets them in trouble with the pirates and Zuko. Yeah. You know, her literally yells at Aang. Yeah. Her insistence on like practicing water bending because of her jealousy of how quick Aang picks it up is how they get in contact with um, Zuko in the pirates. Yeah. I mean, she was practicing in the middle of the night too. And Zuko had mentioned before that they'll only be on the water because they'll be practicing waterbending. Mm-hmm. And if Katara had just stayed asleep, there's a slimmer chance that they would have found him. They would have found I them. think they would have seen their fire from the shore though. That's my thing. That's exactly what I was thinking about. There is a chance that they would have been found anyway, but I think the chance is a lot slimmer if Katara wasn't practicing. Also, when uh, Zuko and Katara meet, this is like their first like one-on-one interaction, isn't it? Yes, it's tense. Let's listen to it. Let's listen to it. No! Let go of me! I'll save you from the pirates. I just want to say... That is the moment in my childhood I started shipping Zatara. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I ship it so hard. I still ship it to this day. Come 
I for me about was it. was never a Zutara shipper. Oh, I was a huge Zutara shipper. I don't think I even knew what shipping was. I don't think oh, I was even I thinking about romance at the no, time. No, I didn't know what shipping was either. But like at the time, I was just like, ooh, I want them to be together. <laughs> I want them to be a couple. Yep. You know, I didn't think about that. I, I, I probably, I was so dense. I probably didn't even pick up on the like very obvious like setup in the first episode of Katara and Aang. <laughs> You're like in the very first episode. It's like this big romantic connection, and like little you is just like they must be really good friends. Yeah, seven year old <laughs> me is like they're just really good friends, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um. We talked about how jealousy can hurt yourself and others. Aang is genuinely grateful for Katara's help, but she can't seem to notice it because she's constantly comparing herself to him. Mm -hmm. And um, that's mostly stemming from her jealousy. Yeah, like it, it it fuels her anger. And like this is the first time we see her get like very, very angry, especially yeah, at Aang. Did. Katara's pride is what holds her back from getting better and growing. I think she forgot the fact be, because of the way Aang acts that he is a master bender. He yeah. has mastered air, so yeah. he does have the basics of bending down. Yeah. But she just doesn't notice. He's a master airbender, so he clearly knows a thing or two about bending. Um, but she won't let herself see past that. Sam, you brought this up a little teeny tiny little bit that you said mm -hmm. we get to later, and it's late. <laughs> it is later now. We are talking about this now. Yeah. The point that I wrote down. Yes. This is my point. Go for it. Um, yeah, so I wrote down hard work versus talent because in this point, it's really where it's at its most obvious. So... Aang is a talented bender, so I can I can see how she got that frustrated. But Katara has worked for a long time to get where she is, and I think she's validly a little upset that Aang is taking to it so quick. Literally, she shows him the move once, and he does it perfectly. Yeah. That's frustrating, and she cannot acknowledge that Aang, the Avatar, could be maybe better at waterbending right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, and this is what I mean, too, by these themes kind of all, like, mesh together. Like, this is something we kind of talked about in the last theme, but we're just covering it from a different point of view in this one. Yeah. You know? A different um, frame of reference. Yeah, so I get, I yeah, I get that. Um, she is a good teacher, um, and she could learn more, but she's like, mm, mm, no talk. I'm supposed to be the man's master. <laughs> I'm supposed to be, even though I don't know that much about waterbending. <laughs> yeah. And this theme is a little bit like difficult to explain, so I'm going to try my best. Um, it's a big word that I'm not sure if I quite know what it means. Interdependence. Mm. Meaning... Everyone in the group depends on, on one each another, other in yeah, a way. I, if that, I would have thought about the parts of the word, I would have got that. Yes. But I didn't. <laughs> um, it starts off in that like they're all very quick at the in the first half of the episode to like call each other out and blame each other for the things that they're doing. Um, Katara scolds Aang for and spending money. Um, Sokka scolds Katara for stealing the scroll. Katara is jealous that Aang is able to get ahead of her, and. Um, they're, yeah, they're just all very quick to jump on each other and blame them for their characteristics where it's because of the different characteristics that they have that they're able to function cohesively as a group. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote at the end of the day, they all need each other. Um, Sokka was the one who helped them escape from the pirates. Uh, Katara and Aang were waterbending to stop the ship. Uh, the whistle... Um, that Aang bought that seemed useless ended up calling Appa so that Appa could come save them. Um, Love even that. yeah, even Momo like was useful in this part. Yes, this was one of the themes in our um, previous episodes. Um, funny enough, in the pilot, I believe. No, it was a theme in um, One Five, The King of Omashu. Um, Omashu, yeah. Which, funny enough, right. was written by the same person. What? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Um, and that is humor. Yay, funny. This, this episode, episode is really funny. funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is really funny. We laughed out loud both times. <laughs> Many times it. while watching this. Um, there's just a lot of like really dumb lines in this episode, and we're gonna play them all in a montage. Yay. Who's brave enough to look into this bird? So 
I actually noticed the first one when we were first watching it. Like, I thought that was really weird that that's like a weird background line that's going on. But I want to talk about the last one because we joked about this like both times after Katana yells at Aang. <laughs> he just looks like stupid hurt. And it's like, oh, are you going to cry? Are you going to cry, Pledge? Are you going to cry? <laughs> you want baby? your mommy, Pledge? You just a little lip quiver, too, which is a real thing. Which I we do really shouldn't be making fun of it. But no, I even defended him, too. You were just like, oh, little bitch, gonna cry. It's and, funny. And I was just like, what? No, he's a little child. It's he's sad. Funny. Katara was very mean. Um, speaking of the King of Amashu, we, uh, we, there's another character that comes back. Wow, there's a lot of connections to 1-5. There really is. It's almost as if they were written by the same person. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Cabbage Man. Cabbage He's Man back. Back. <laughs> He's back with his cabbages. I bet, I bet Mr. O'Brien was, <laughs> <laughs> I, bet, I bet Mr. O'Brien was just like, I'm going to insert a recurring joke and hope it catches on. Jesus. It and did. It did. <laughs> it's it did. very funny. It's very, very funny. And he's got another quippy line. Let's, Let's listen. Take a listen. My cabbages! This place is worse than Omashu! Um, speaking mm. of scenes that we're just going to talk about briefly, uh, there's two here that are pretty funny. First one is when they're fighting the pirates and they're in that big... Um, Dust smoke cloud. cloud. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Smoke they have like cloud. smoke bombs that yeah. they throw down. Um, Sokka is looking for Aang and he asks him where he is and Aang like clears all of the smoke around him and he finds that he's surrounded by both pirates and um, Fire Nation soldiers and then he like just picks up the smoke again and like hides himself and he goes uh never mind I'll come find <laughs> you and I'm sorry that is literally peak comedy that is peak it does visual not comedy get any better than explaining that. that joke is way worse than it seeing really it really is you gotta just watch it I mean I, like if you're listening say, to this episode you've if you've seen the the corresponding yeah, avatar episode hopefully yeah I bet I bet there are a fair amount of people that are just listening to this because they've seen it before. Yeah. You gotta go back and watch the episodes. Really? People. Yeah. You gotta watch it with us anyway. Which like I'm guilty of. I'm listening to the Office podcast right now. And I was trying to keep up week by week, but I'm I'm at the point where I'm like ten episodes ahead of them now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna wait. <laughs> Yeah, dare I say that joke with Aang and the smoke is probably the best one we've seen so far. Oh, I would agree. It is my favorite I joke. I would agree. It's very funny. It's very funny. Very, very funny. Speaking of very funny that I think we just find funny for some reason yeah. is when Sokka is just tossed into the sail of the <laughs> ship when they're fighting. It's like and he's not just, just like, like ah! Into just the sail. It's them. like he is tossed like, over the deck and it's like lands really hard in the sail too. and, like, and like rolls throw back as onto as the they boat. Can. It's so funny. It's so funny. And it like kind of comes out of nowhere too. Like they were just focusing on something else. And then all of a sudden you see Sokka, he's already picked up and he just gets thrown into the sail. Dare I say yeeted into the sail. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Yoat. Yoat into the sail. Very funny visual comedy. Um, and there's one more point that I want to talk about. Iroh. Iroh. <laughs> oh, Uncle Iroh. Iroh. Oh, Iroh. God, he, he, he's a hoot. <laughs> he is a hoot. Um. A hoot of an old man. Sam, do you think, do you think we've done too many lines this episode? No. Okay. No, I don't think. Well, we should do like five more. All right, let's put together a montage of Iroh's lines. <laughs> Okay. Changed our course for a stupid lotus tile? See, you, like most people, underestimate its value. Aang, this is all my fault. No, Katara, it isn't. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> Are you so busy fighting you cannot see your own ship has set sail? We have no time for your proverbs, Uncle. It's no proverb. Sam, I personally find it very funny when at the very end of the episode, <laughs> Iroh pulls the pie show tile that he was looking for out of his sleeve and Zuko just throws it. Oh my God. It is very funny. It's peak. 
It's peak Zuko Iro interaction. It really is. Also, like how he keep all that in his sleeve. Like how does it just how stay does it in stay his in sleeve? There? Like his sleeves does are he have pretty sleeve loose. Pockets? Like does he have sleeve pockets? I don't know. Like his sleeves are very loose. So how did it just like stay? It in was there? in my sleeves the whole time. How did you not feel that? How do you not know. feel your tile in there? I don't Whatever. Know. It's funny. We'll forgive it. Well, I'm not saying, like, how did he not feel it? I'm saying, how did it not fall out? That's true, too. You know? Like, whatever. His, his sleeves are very loose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how did it not just, like, jangle, jangle around in there? It's comedy. We will suspend our disbelief. I am willing to suspend my for disbelief now. for that for that one specific scene. Uh-huh. I'm here for it. Sam, I really can't talk anymore about Iroh without getting into character talk. Well, so, we usually take a break before we get into character, okay, so let's, let's take do a that. quick break then because I'm excited. <laughs> okay, let's do it. All right, we are back from our break, and now we are going to talk about characters. You know who we should talk about first? Who? The protagonist. Wait, I don't know who that is. I don't have the script right in front of me. It's (laughs) Ong. Ong. Ong is the protagonist. No, it's Aang. It's Aang. We're not talking about that. Okay, we're going to to be really serious now. We're going to be serious. So, yeah, literally at the top of the episode, Aang is quite literally having a panic attack because of all the shit he just learned. Literally just learned. I'm assuming it is on the ride out from the (laughs) island. They are, like, like yeeting out of the Fire Nation. (laughs) And this be going on. (laughs) Yeah, so the reality of... Being the Avatar really starts to set in and all the things he has to do. Yeah, and he has to do it in an accelerated timeline. And the joke that Sokka makes does not help. No. He's just like, it only took you 112 years to master it. And it's just like, Sokka, shut up. That reminds me of like when you're like sobbing about something, you know, and your dad who doesn't know anything about human interaction tries making a joke because that's all he knows to make you feel better and it just makes you cry harder. Yeah, poor I taste. Like, I feel like that's a common dad thing. Sokka's a bad dad. You Sokka heard it here bad first. Dad. It's like, it's no wonder that he's stressed and panicked at the top of the episode. He was literally just force fed all of this information about his destiny and all the stuff he has to do. Yeah. And uh, Avatar that's Roku hard to like, deal with. Open up your mouth and eat it. Yeah, exactly. A bunch your of information you're going to swallow. We have to do this by the summer solstice. He's like, hey, if you don't get this done, the whole world is going to die. Mm-hmm. Good luck, babe. Yeah. Winky kissy face. Good luck. Figure it out, Aang. Yeah. You got to figure it out. Yep. Yeah. Rightly uh, a little bit stressed. Yep. But, you know, that kickstarts the plot of the episode and mm-hmm. that Katara tries helping him. And we talked about this a little bit, um, but Aang picks up on bending really quickly. Duh. He's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, duh. Well, like, yeah, duh. He's the Avatar. Like, we talked about this a little bit. He is... You were touching on that he's talented, and I would say he is a prodigy, right? Um, yes, he did work very, very hard, but, like, no one fucking masters airbending at 12 years old. Yeah. And he mastered airbending. Mm-hmm. Like, he is a master airbender. That takes he has talent. his tattoos. Talent is just the ability to pick up on things quicker. It doesn't mean you don't work hard to get there, yeah. but you naturally pick it up faster than people around him. Yes. And obviously he did that. Yes. Like, I imagine, like, they gave him a skill and the master was just like, it took me 10 years to master this. And he did it for like an hour and then was Aang, better at, Aang at it is the master. is the Mozart of bending. Yes, he is. We also learned that he's very impulsive. We kind of already knew that. He's like a very whimsical, like up in the air person. And being impulsive is a very yeah. common thing among people that it's are associated like associated with that. Yeah, exactly. So he just buys the whistle with... One of the three copper pieces they have left. He's like, mm, we're dirt poor. Here's a cute whistle. Here's a cute whistle that I don't even know that works. He's like, it looks like Appa. We only have three copper pieces left. Actually, we have two. And I bought this useless whistle. Mm-hmm. Nice, Aang. And I love yeah. Katara's joke slash very serious line. to be like, I'll take the money. Yeah. Um, love that. We also learned that while he's bending, he likes to show off. Um, this is something we already saw in the Warriors of Kiyoshi, but we see it again here. So nice to just touch up and get a little reminder. On yes, that. he is. He likes flair. He likes showmanship. He likes people to look at him and be like, 
wow, he's good at Ooh, what he does. He's a good bender. He'd be a theater kid. Jesus, stop it. Aang's a theater kid. Um, there's two parts about Aang in this episode that I'm not really sure I fully enjoy. Um, one, he has a line where he says, I used to look up to pirates, which is weird. Why? Why would he look up to pirates? Because they're cool. They no. sail the seven seas they and they steal people. stuff and they're cool. They are terrible people. Why would he look up to the them? Concepts, concept of being a pirate is cool to every kid at one point. Okay, okay? yeah, but doesn't seem like any. But then he actually wanna, meets some and he's yeah. like, oh. Yeah. Want to know what else doesn't seem like Aang? Um, after he finds out Katara stole the scroll, he just says, well, what's done is done. No, that doesn't seem like Aang. He seems like the kind of person that's like, we must do good at all times. Yeah. He's you just know? like, well, you did the thing and it's already done. So it just felt like Mr. O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> it just felt like it's just like, well, got to move the plot along. I like, uh, don't know how to get myself out of this. So let's keep going. Um, speaking of the uh, let's keep going. Um, let's talk about cat scan next. Um, yeah. Let's talk about Katara. So. I think Katara very much thinks of herself as the mature one. Mm -hmm. She thinks, you know, she is, I don't want to say mother of the group, but definitely like the eldest and the most responsible. She, she is takes, like the self-designated caretaker of them. Exactly. She exactly. is the wrangler of the mm -hmm. reckless children. Yeah, she wrangles the money from Aang after he buys the yeah, whistle. Both her and Sokka like, see the whistle as completely useless even though it ends up saving them later. Yeah, I, no one saw that coming. Yeah, no, literally no one did. I guess you could, like, infer that it might be used to call Appa because it looks like Appa. Yeah, that's true. It does look like Appa. Um, but when it doesn't work, you're kind of like, oh, okay. Yeah, the, the thing that kind of drives that home is that it doesn't make a noise. He just blows into it. It just sounds like air is being blown through it. Yeah. So you're just like, well, that's just a useless trinket. Yeah, and you said we would touch on this a little bit more later. Taking the money away from Aang is like a way of her asserting control and that she knows more and she knows what's best more than what Aang does. To be fair, she's not very impulsive. That's true. So it's like, I think that was the responsible move, but yeah, the point being here that she is taking it upon herself to assert control yes. over it. To be like, okay, clearly you can't take care of yourself, so now I have to. Yeah. Um, I think she's right, <laughs> though. Well, you know, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are other things that she can't take care of herself that Aang has to help her do. So mm -hmm. that was back in our part one theme, interdependence. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we also touched on this a little bit in the hard work versus talent. Um, she's been working on waterbending her whole life. Um, so she thinks that she should be the one that is better than Aang. Um, and all of this combined um, kind of just makes it like a huge eye opener or like jarring um, culture shock maybe. Yeah. Um, when Aang kind of subverts all of her expectations. Like she kind of forgets that Aang does have a responsible side. Mm -hmm. It's just his like... His surface personality kind of clouds that sometimes. Sometimes you forget that, you know, he is responsible and can make responsible choices. She like she just sees Aang as, as a kid. All of that is kind of like thrown out the window when he subverts all of her expectations. Like his impulse purchase was actually helpful. He's a better waterbender than her right away. He's actually smart and he actually says useful things. And this is all very jarring to her because she thought of herself as the more mature one, the more responsible one, the more knowledgeable one. And it's all being confronted, like pushed in her face right now like hey that might not all be true it might be true to some extent but not all of it she can't um acknowledge ang's infinite wisdom mm -hmm. um Shut about up. everything jesus <laughs> sam, your infinite touched, wisdom gets a little old sam we touched on this in uh the sixth episode in prison in that she has a strong sense of pride for mm -hmm. who she is and here we are we see that again she has a strong sense of pride water bending is clearly important to her. It is something very near to her and very near to her culture that she clung on to. And it's very upsetting for her when Aang, someone who is not even from the water tribe, picks up on it literally right away. Mm -hmm. So yep. 
I can't even imagine what that's like to be like, this is something that was ripped away from me and I have worked my whole life to try to achieve some sense of it. And you're not even from my culture and you suddenly know it better than I do. Yep. Suddenly you're telling me what I need to do to practice my culture. Yes. Very frustrating. Let's talk about soccer. Let's move on to soccer. Not Once much again. Here. Well, uh, not much here, but still some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we've we've seen a lot of his. This is just again just reaffirming parts of his character, but I think it's uh, it's worth mentioning and noting again. Yes. He sh- once again shows how smart he is. Um, he's able to trick the pirates into getting them away from Zuko, and that mm-hmm. I wouldn't have thought of that. He was just yeah, like, oh, is- I can use Ang to negotiate yeah, us that, out of this that situation. That was like some severe reverse psychology shit. Yeah, it really, like that it was really was. Really good. That was really smart. I would not have thought about that. Why don't you cover this next point? Because you wrote it down. I don't really know what you mean. Oh, the voice of reason. What I meant by that is that he is the one in this episode to. He brings up like you stole it, and that was wrong. You know, that mm-hmm. is a very like Sokka's black and white way of viewing the world like this is right this is wrong this is manly this is womanly yeah um that's how his brain works and yeah. you know we are going to see him start to blur those lines yep um but in this episode he's the one to bring up like hey what you did was wrong when usually i'm pretty sure it's katara that does that it's just like Sokka is establishing that he has a moral compass too that's what i meant it's a good way to explain it um the last character is zuko <laughs> He's very dramatic. He's so dramatic in this episode. He is like peak dramatic teenager in this episode. Um, Sam? Uh. Are you ready for another montage? Are our listeners ready for they another They better montage? because here comes a Zuko line montage. Woo! What's the meaning of this mutiny? I didn't steal it if that's what you're wondering. I like how when he's like trying to negotiate with Katara, he's basically like, I might be holding you captive and trying to kidnap one of your friends and blackmail you. But at least I don't steal things from <laughs> people like you, you dirty little water tribe person. Yeah, well, he stealer. <laughs> he feels like he's justified in this because he's trying to work towards his goal. Yep. So anything is justified, but um, which what? apparently stealing from lowly pirates is not justified. What Sam? What what's his goal? His goal is to capture the Avatar. Why? To <laughs> restore my honor. His honor! <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, it starts to become a little bit of a running joke. Yeah. But it's like, I also get it because it's the one thing he's clinging on to. He's going to capture Aang. He's going to bring Aang back to the Fire Nation and be welcomed back by his father. Yeah. So it makes sense. But... It doesn't mean as viewers watching it, <laughs> we're not just like, funny. stop talking about your honor. <laughs> yeah. We know. We yeah. know already. Yeah, I agree. Honor. My honor. My honor. Sam, let's close out this section about characters. And before we head into our verdicts, let's just hear one last line. Try to understand. I need to capture him to restore something I've lost. My honor. Sam, we just got done talking about our characters. We haven't discussed our favorite characters yet. We just got done talking about characters in general. Who was your favorite? Oh, let's see. This was uh, not a hard choice for me. Really? Okay. Because when watching the episode, it was very clear. Uncle Iroh. Tell me about it. I just like him so much because he's such an entertaining character. The relationship between... Zuko's personality and Iroh's is just so funny, mm-hmm. but also like Iroh's so likable and he's such a lighthearted person and he has a lot of funny lines in this episode, especially the, the one at the end, you know, when he's just like, yeah, it is your fault. Mm-hmm. Both times I'm just like, wow, Iroh is really the best part of this episode. Like yeah. the, the writing on his character is so good. I liked it so much. Yeah. Okay, Tyler, who was yeah. your favorite character? Sam, unlike you, I did have a hard time choosing. Who oh, my really? Was. Yeah, I had a hard time because I liked them all a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, there wasn't really anything I disliked about any of the characters, and they all had really funny bits. So I had a hard time choosing between them. But I'd agree with you, my favorite was also Iroh. Um, I just think he was really funny throughout the entire thing, and 
I just kept laughing at him, and yep. I think you really summed it up pretty well in everything you said it's about him. Reason enough to for him to be your favorite character. He doesn't have to do the like best things in the episode. He was Thank quite you. literally the funniest yep. and the most entertaining to watch. And that's why he was my favorite. Sam. Yeah. What? What do you rate this episode? You know, I will tell you the discussion we just had just informed a score switch on my part. Oh, okay. A score bump, if you will. Okay. We literally just talked about how every character was likable and well-written in this episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this just informed a score switch. You want to know my rating for this episode, right? I, yes, I think I have a pretty good idea. It was a nine. Oh, okay. And now it is a 10. Okay, yep, that's what I thought it was it going to be. It bumped up from a nine to a 10 because all of the characters in this episode are written... Their personalities are 100% shown through the things they do and say in this episode. Mm -hmm. I think it is a perfect filler episode. Okay. It's a perfect episode to show, like, how these characters function and how they think. I think, and I will stand by this opinion for now, that this is a perfect rendition of all of these characters written in a very, very funny and like entertaining way mm -hmm. and that is why i'm giving it a 10 it's just a perfect presentation of these characters and of this story okay i've said my opinion on this episode my verdict what is your verdict on this episode sam i would give this episode a nine so i think that's really funny that we were on the same <laughs> wavelength beforehand yes um i would i seriously considered giving it a 10 um but when i looked at my chart for how we rate episodes 10 is labeled masterpiece this is a must see for one reason or another and nine is labeled awesome would definitely recommend seeing and when it comes down to it for me i'm thinking like would i tell someone who has never seen avatar the last airbender before would i be like this is one of the episodes that you have to watch and the answer wasn't yes for me discreet okay <laughs> I think this is an episode that is like, if you like Avatar The Last Airbender, this is a perfect episode. And like, if you like Avatar The Last Airbender, yes, I would give it a 10. But this isn't something where it's like, if someone has never seen Avatar The Last Airbender before, I wouldn't say, oh, start with the waterbending scroll. <laughs> Um, which is why I give it a nine, but it is a nine for all of the other reasons that you said it is. It's a very funny episode. It was hysterical. All of the characters were perfectly well-written, well-rounded. Um, I was never bored. Um, and no, I'm, it is literally yeah. never boring. Um, I just gave it like it flew by. We watched it two or three times and it just, it flies by. It, it really um, does. It feels like a 10 minute episode. Yeah. Okay. It, it's time. I need to gush about just how good the writing, like okay. Mr. O'Brien I am addressing you as Mr. O'Brien because I forgot your first name. John. I'm sorry, John. John, I love the writing in this episode, and I affirm my 10 because of how the writing just interweaves with, with everything. Like, uh, decisions made at the top of the episode inform decisions made later, and the whole thing with the whistle does kind of seem like a cheap writing trope, but the way it's presented and, like, how it intertwines with you know, Katara asserting her control and then how that informs her pride and things like, uh, John O'Brien knows these characters so well that he wrote this episode that perfectly encapsulates their personality. And that's why I would recommend it to mm -hmm. like first time watchers. I'd be like, this is one of the episodes I would probably start with. And John, I know what episodes you write, and this is the only one that I kind of like, so <laughs> you don't get a perfect score from me. Oh my gosh, okay. Wow, <laughs> that's a hot take. It's piping hot. All right, let's wrap this. Yeah, let's let's wrap it. Edits. Let's wrap it up. And that's all we have for this episode. Huge thank you goes out to our producer and audio engineer, Aaron Bogan, along with his production company, Sound Event Productions, and Annie Galloway, who made our cover art and is our graphic designer. Make sure you join us next week. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please 
give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Please do that. It's how people find our podcast. I cannot stress this enough. If you want to get more involved with our Avatar content, please feel free to reach out to us. Send us questions about the show, fan theories that you have, what you thought of this episode, something we mentioned that we liked, or something we didn't mention that you wish we would have talked about. Our email is at airbenderpod at gmail.com. And you can tweet us or follow us on Instagram, both at airbenderpod. That's A-I-R bender P-O-D. If you want to keep in touch and stay updated in the Avatar fandom, make sure to join our Facebook community page at the Avatar Podcast Yip Yip Community, where you can discuss the show with other fans and ourselves. If there's not that many people, please join anyway. Don't be afraid. Um, I'm Tyler Strandberg, the host, creator, and writer of this show. And you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, both at TylerJohn7. That's T-Y-L-E-R-J-O-N and the number seven. I'm Sam Albus, the co-host and co-writer of this show. You can follow me on Twitter at Sam underscore Albus or on Instagram at Sam Albus. My last name is spelled A-L-B-U-S. Thanks for putting up with us, even though we're a mess. Tune in next week. Yay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.